and, or cooperatives. So not-for-profit firms are tax exempt, but can't take any of the profits that they earn and pay them out to people outside of the firm. Um, they can only use them for internal investment, and these are tightly regulated. Co cooperatives um, can pay out profits, but only to people who are workers or customers of the firm. A final form of organization are state-owned corporations, which are run by the government and are either subsidized by or um, uh, pay profits into the state treasury. And these are not very common in the most developed countries anymore. Now, corporations have two primary methods of financing. Um, is Jacob here? I don't see him. Um, uh, does anyone else know what the two main ways that corporations are financed are? Yeah, Kevin. Um, either like equity or debt. Equity or debt, that's right. Um, and debt can come either from banks or from bonds. And the interest on debt can be deducted from a firm's operating expenses. And debt holders retain some control over the company by having some form of restriction on what the company is allowed to do, some covenant. Equity holders, on the other hand, uh, are tax disadvantaged because the, uh, the dividends that they pay out, you can't deduct those from taxes the way that you can deduct the payments that are made out to bondholders, but they get voting shares to control the company in exchange. There's also some things that are in between, like preferred shares or junior debt. Okay, so most of the course is going to focus on the assumption that firms maximize profits, um, but there's a natural question of whether this is what they actually do or what they should do. And for the moment, um, I'm going to assume that owners want them to be maximizing profits. This is not necessarily the case because shareholders might have charitable goals themselves and there are socially responsible investment funds. But um, one argument that Milton Friedman makes is that shareholders uh, may um, be able to just take the profits that the company makes and use those on the char charitable goals they have themselves and there's no reason why they need to do it through the company. Okay. So a natural question is, should managers try to accomplish this goal? And the uh, corporate social responsibility people argue that not necessarily. Maybe they should try to look out for social welfare and not just for the interests of the company or, or the shareholders. Um, in particular, they argue that uh, companies have responsibilities to deal with externalities and with other social goals. And Milton Friedman argues quite forcefully against uh, this view. And why is that saying? Um, first of all, because uh, the executives are not principally themselves, but they are just an agent of the Yep. So if they use the company money in the ways they want, they're just stealing from the customers. Yeah, that's uh, the way you can think about it is imagine that you were to hire someone to go buy a sandwich for you, and that person, instead of buying the sandwich, were to go and uh, give the money to the beggar who is sitting next to the sandwich shop, you would think that that person had stolen from you in order to satisfy their desire to give to the beggar, right? And maybe that wouldn't be such a good thing, right? Um, and by pursuing these social goals, the managers impose their views on the shareholders. If there are externalities, he argues, shouldn't it be the role of the government to solve those externalities and not the role of the manager on his own discretion to choose how to address the externalities. And in, on the other hand, if shareholders have the goal of um, you know, doing some charitable activity, why don't they just do that with the money they get back and not force the other shareholders to do that? Can anyone think of a counter argument to that? Yeah, Lancelot. I mean, it seems that he kind of, uh, so he talks about freedom. Yeah. So uh, I think that like, economic freedom is actually the reason why uh, a manager that would, uh, I don't know if I take like someone's money to, buy, uh, to give it to a baker yeah. rather than paying a sandwich. Yeah. See, the people who give me the money can fire me. Yeah. Because they can freedom. That means that, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not actually stealing his money because 
Maybe, but what? Yeah, what, he's what? Like he's not ask me again to but why might it not make sense for the shareholders to take their money out and give it to uh, A couple of reasons. Like yeah. First, anytime, in theory, the shareholders decide what happens through voting yep. for the board. Yep. So anything that the shareholders as a collective group want is. Well, well that's what, sort of what Lancelot was saying, but can you see, think of a stronger argument than I, that? I think the, the second one is if they take money out of the company, then they're effectively draining money from the company, uh, which. Mm, yeah, what's your name? Ari. Ari, yeah, Ari. So, they, by themselves, only have one person's worth of money to contribute to a cause, whereas if they can get a whole group of shareholders together, they can contribute a lot to a bigger cause. That, 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 that's a good reason. I think there's an even stronger reason. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I What's your name? Ron. Ron. I feel like there are institutional things where you can do more good through a company's activities than through your own spending. If any other example, like you know, basic research at a place like Bell Labs. Yeah. I think that that's, the Bell Labs, I think, is like the perfect example. And it, it's similar to what Ari said, but it's even stronger because there may be something in what the company's doing that's highly complementary with the social goal. So like, for example, right now I have this company around quadratic voting, and I really think quadratic voting is a great thing for the world. Uh, and I can think of almost no way to get quadratic voting out there as an idea, except through starting a company that has positive revenues that you know creates products around that, right? So I, I just don't even, think it would be possible for me just through my charitable activities to do nearly as much for it as I could through this and conversely the company if it were to like start in you know promoting cubic voting or whatever uh, because that was more profitable uh, you know I don't think that there would have been a, like as good of a way to promote its social goal you know yeah you see there's like a strong complementarity between what the company's doing and the social goal inevitably so I think that's an important counter argument to uh, Friedman's point. Um, so, but he argues that unless you help, um, unless this helps uh, uh, to sell things to consumers, which it might, right? If you think about Whole Foods, like they do all this charitable stuff, but a lot of it's just a way to sell stuff to consumers, right? Because the, they have all these earthy, earthy, crunchy consumers who want to be affiliated with uh, Whole Foods, right? Um, then effectively it's stealing. Now, most economists are pretty sympathetic to Friedman's argument. Um, basically, that unless the executive himself wants to take some pay cut in order to do these activities, that um, it's not their judge, job to judge what the company should be doing. Ha yeah, Arvid. Like you said, for the, that you can accomplish your goals better through, the, through your company, like if the other like uh, shareholders don't agree with that, couldn't you like start buying up, start buying them up with yeah. the money they're spending on their consumption while you could? Yeah, so, so my personal view about this is that um, there should be some corporate social responsibility, but that it shouldn't just be the manager's discretion, that there should be a formal mechanism through which, you know, there's collective decisions made by the people where they trade off in a way like you're describing so that it maximizes all their interests and that the losers get compensated uh, that The, unlike shareholders, other stakeholders like workers and consumers can more easily, if they're not getting what they want from the company, go to another company uh, and work there or buy their goods from there. 
Whereas once you've given your cap your capital to the company, they could just completely walk off and screw you uh, if they don't have some way to sort of grab uh, control of you, right? Um, so without ethical or legal protections, it would be very easy to expropriate um, the uh, the people who give capital to the company. And even if you want to redistribute to people who own from people who own capital to other people. Why not just do that elsewhere through the tax system rather than undermining the whole system of corporate finance, uh, which is meant to protect these uh, people? So um, as a result, most economists would argue in most uh, dimensions that governance should protect shareholders and profit. OK. So um, a naive definition of uh, what it means to maximize profits is just the total revenue we bring in minus cost. But there's a number of problems with that definition. One is the distinction between economic profits and accounting profits. Um, and Felipe? Felipe Hayakawa? No. Does anyone else want to give an example of a de distinction between economic and accounting profits? Uh, what's your name? Wesley. Wesley. Uh, economic profits have to take into consideration costs such as opportunity costs, mm -hmm. cost of your time while accounting profits. What's an example of an opportunity cost that might not be taken into account in accounting? The time you spend working on a project. Yeah, so like if someone's running their own business, they might count their, not count their time as a cost, right? But of course it is a cost because they could have been making money working somewhere else during that time, right? Um, another example of this is that you know if a company spends all of its current cash buying up um, other companies that generate profits, that might increase its profit, but it's not actually profitable to it unless the profits that it buys from those other companies are greater than the amount that it spent on them. Right. Um, time and discounting is another issue, right? So profits later than today are not worth as much as profits today, because profits earned today can be used, reinvested, uh, and make more money. But on the other hand, there are many things that might hurt today's profits that might in the long run have quite a lot of value, and so you can't just be completely short term. So there's an interesting trade-off between short and longer term profits. Now the trickiest issues come up with regards to uncertainty. So when there's uncertainty and you just don't know what would maximize the profits of the firm, the only thing you can really do is maximize the expected profits of the firm. But even that's not what you want to do because you want to think about risks, right? So you don't just want to on average maximize the profit, but you want to maximize sort of the right risk adjusted average profit, right? So what has been often advocated as a solution is uh, stock market value, that firms should maximize the value of their uh, stock, their uh, company's stock in the market. But there's a bunch of problems with this as well. First of all, it's not even well defined for private companies because there is no stock market in which they're traded. Second, it's not clear that stock market is really that good at assessing the value of the company. Uh, and it might uh, even be systematically manipulable. Like someone might come in and buy up a bunch of the stock to try to make the CEO look better uh, or to get the company to take a different action. And, uh, you know, the truth is that in most of the settings we're going to talk about, n none of these issues here are really going to become all that important, but they're good things to keep in mind when you think about what does it really mean for a company to be maximizing profits. Okay, so another problem arises from the conflict among the different shareholders. One conflict is over whether the company should, prefer, uh, should pursue profit or whether they should pursue a different goal, right? Um, so if some of the shareholders support corporate social responsibility or socially responsible investors, they might be in conflict with the other uh, investors, as we were talking about with Arvid. Um, now, while Friedman's response is that you should just give the money back, as Ron was pointing out, uh, that might not be the most efficient way of pursuing the goals of the company, right? Uh, if those are partly social and partly private. Um, so, for example, in my company, 
I might really want to pursue quadratic stuff, but you might end up having another shareholder or CEO who just wants to make money. And if they find that there's some other algorithm related to it, they might want to try to implement that instead, right? Um, different perspectives on risk among different shareholders can also be a problem. Uh, why is that? Is Miles here? Yeah, yeah Miles. Um, in terms of just the horizon of when you wanted to get your money, so the different shareholders are in different positions. Yeah. So am I going to want to take more conservative positions that might affect what the logic of growth is going to be? Yeah. So just given sort of different perspectives on where they want their money to invest. Exactly. And some might, you know, have be worried about certain things happening to them and want the company to invest in ways that protects them against those events in their personal life. And others might have opposite concerns, right? So that's another, another issue, right? There can also be conflicts between different classes of shareholders. So not all shares are the same and they may well have different interests. Um, and this is a small problem at most companies because most shareholders uh, are, have similar um, have similar payoffs, but that's not true at all companies. Another huge problem has to do with large shareholders. Is uh, uh, Kim here? Suwon Kim? Oh yeah. Do you go by Suwon or do you go by Kim? Okay, because I don't. Because usually the names are reversed, so I didn't. I didn't know. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Go, go, uh, why might large shareholders be a problem for a firm? Their interests are, I think, not different, but like different in magnitude. Well, so that's a natural. That's that's one possibility. But there is much more extreme reasons why large shareholders might be able to do things that were really not in the interest of other shareholders. So that's that's true. Can anyone think of a particularly perverse thing that a large shareholder might be able to do? Yeah, you were in my class, but remind, remind me of your, your name. What? Luke. Luke, Luke, yeah. So what might they do? Like take over the whole company, like I, I can't even get or something like that. Yeah, so a, a really bad thing they could do is they could take over 50, they could buy 51% of the shares and then force the company to sell itself for one cent to a company they 100% control. That's a way that by buying 51% of the shares they can get 100% control of the company, right? And if someone else is anticipating they're going to do that, then everyone's going to think their shares are worth nothing and therefore be willing to sell them very cheaply to the guy. And he'll be able to basically like take over the company, steal everything from it for nothing. Right? So that's a pretty big problem that a majority shareholder could, could do. Right? Um, and so as a result of this, there's lots of legal protections for minority shareholders to try to prevent this sort of thing from happening. Another thing that there is, so to try to solve these so, uh, conflicts between shareholders. One solution is to have voting among the shareholders. Another is to um, have buyouts where uh, someone who can raise enough money if the company's not performing well can come and buy out the whole company. Now in the last class when we talk about quadratic voting I'll talk more about some other ways to try to solve these problems. Um, okay, so managers have their own, uh, another major problem that companies face is that the managers tend to have their own interests rather than the company as a whole's interests uh, in mind, right? And they themselves employ managers below them who have the companies, who have their own interests and not the company's interests in mind. And they employ foremen who have their interests and not the company's interests in mind. And they employ line workers who have their own interests and not the company's interests in mind, right? So I don't know if anyone's ever heard the joke about uh, uh, this woman who goes to a great uh, Hindu sage and says, you know, you know, master, why doesn't the earth fall, right? And the sage says, well, he's sitting on top of a turtle. And then he says, well, but what's the turtle sitting on top of? Like, well, the turtle is sitting on top of two turtles, right? And what are those two turtles sitting on top of? They're sitting on top of three turtles, right? And then she says, well, what are those three turtles? And he says, lady, it's turtles all the way down, right? Uh, so that's the way that uh, principal agent problems are in, uh, in firms, right? And because of all these conflicts, uh, it, this naturally leads to sub suboptimal behavior, which we'll talk about more in a moment. 
But the ideal situation is that the person who's making the decisions is the person who owns the firm. Why is that uh, ideal? Uh, Sung Su? Sung Su here? No? Does anyone else want to answer that? Uh, yeah, Connor. Because um, the owner is the person who will ultimately benefit from or pay for the company, and the manager is the person who makes those decisions. So they'll, they're, their interests are aligned, and so there's no principal agent problem. That's right. Now, this is usually impossible because usually the people who have the talent to actually start a company are not the same people who have the money to, uh, to get it started. that directly give you some part of the cash from the company. Another um, is, but of course, that is not going to be uh, a major incentive for most people because most people only have a small influence over the whole thing that the company is doing. Something that can go one step further, just a little step further, is having that equity vest over time so that you have to stay with the company or you have to look out for the long-term interests of the company in order to make any money off of that or giving compensation that's contingent on various things happening. Another, another version of this is you having some personal liability if something goes really wrong with the company or there if it, being able to, if something really goes wrong, claw back the money that you've already earned. Another uh, incentive is just directly managing or getting on top of the back of someone below you in the company, right? So you can give them very detailed instructions or you can really closely watch what they do. Um, that's what some managers like foremen do. They just go around, they watch that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. A fourth uh, incent form of incentive is the possibility of lawsuits or auditing what's going on in the company to make sure that people aren't stealing. Another thing is what's called uh, efficiency wages. So efficiency or wages is when you make the job really attractive or generous to make sure people will be terrified of losing their job because they really want to keep that cushy job that they have. And that uh, can keep people working hard. Another thing that can do that is people can be interested in getting promoted within the company because there's really good jobs to be had higher up and that desire for promotion can give people an incentive to work hard. You can also give bonuses, either based on objective things you achieve, like making a certain number of sales, or more subjective things, like whether your boss thinks you're doing a good job or not. Uh, another thing like this is uh, reputational incentives or career concerns so, uh, outside the company. You might work hard so that you get a good reputation so you can get 
uh, a good job outside the company. But then we get into even softer things. So we're sort of gradually progressing from like just like payments down to things that are more uh, subjective and might sound cushy, but are just as important in organizing companies. So um, one thing you might try to do is create in someone a sense of identity that like they are the sort of person who does a certain type of thing. And that's very important in professions. So for example, doctors have to take this Hippocratic oath that they're going to look after the interests of their patients, that they won't harm their patients. Uh, lawyers are instilled with certain principles of looking out for the law, et cetera. And you know, Apple, when it builds this whole corporate culture of we're so creative, we do all these cool products, whatever, that's an attempt to get their employees to internalize this idea of who they are and that who they are is linked to the goals of the company, right? Leadership uh, can do this as well. An inspiring leader can make people want to emulate him, look up to him, do the same things that the leader does. Um, the, or you can uh, use leadership to frighten people. So if you read like Machiavelli, uh, leadership is all about the combination of fear and love for the leader, right? And that's what inspires people down. They're afraid that the leader will come after them or they're, uh, they're inspired by love for the leader to uh, uh, do the things that they should do. Uh, peer pressure can, at a more horizontal level, play a similar role. Uh, Intrinsic motivation can be another important uh, form of getting people to work harder, right? Uh, there are some jobs in which people really want to do what they're doing. So for example, that's a very important form of motivation in academia, that people really love uh, what they're doing. And in that case, you actually want to give people a lot of freedom. Because if you're forcing them to do something, but they're really internally motivated, then um, you're, they're going to think that that's not an interesting thing to do, and they're not going to want to do it, right? Uh, and so giving freedom or a sense of mission to people uh, is a good way of harnessing their internal motivations. Another very important form of motivation is reciprocity or family ties. If you put a whole family and a firm together, they're going to be worried about helping their, the other people in their family, and so you can make them work harder in order to, uh, or do good things that are in the interest of the firm in order to help other people who are in their family. And in fact, you can try to establish a sense of family or camaraderie or teamwork among um, groups. This is a very common thing to do in the military. So for example, in ancient Greece, it was very famous that people would often fight in these two groups of two people, who men who would often have a homosexual relationship with one another, because they would try to establish some very tight family bond between them. And even though that hasn't persisted, Though actually the Nazis very famously uh, had these very tight, maybe semi-homosexual relationships in the groups of SS to try to bind all the SS uh, groups together. And if you saw Fight Club, there's sort of like undertones uh, of that throughout the film as well. Um, and, uh, but more broadly in the military, if you ask most people why do you fight, it's not for an abstract cause. It's because you want to help your buddies. And how do they form that sense of buddies? Well, usually what they do at the beginning of the military is they totally brutalize you. Uh, and the only people you can rely on are the people nearby you, right? And that forms this tight sense of loyalty to each other, uh, which uh, uh, helps um, uh, create uh, that, that sort of teamwork. Um, so economists tend to talk about the incentives that are high up this list and much less th those that are low down in this list. But in the marketplace, we see people using these incentives low down in the list all the time. So they must, if we believe in our other results, uh, think that they have some uh, value and validity. Okay, so um, these incentive uh, schemes are used to solve a very wide range of very different types of incentive problems. Um, one of the simplest is uh, embezzlement, right? So people could just steal money from companies. Now, that sounds a little extreme, but in fact, this is one of the uh, most important things that uh, uh, bookkeeping is used to solve. The reason why we have all these receipts, the reason why you have uh, all these, this accounting is to make sure people aren't embezzling money. And security cameras, the most important reason they have security cameras in so many buildings and in uh, stores is often not 
because they're afraid of other people coming in and stealing, but the, because they're afraid of the employees stealing money from the cash register. Um, and this is a particularly big problem in developing world and a particular reason why there are so many small family businesses because people want to make sure they can trust people from stealing. Another problem is shirking, just being lazy, right? Just blatantly not working is the simplest, but there, there are also things like not focusing on your job, not preparing outside for your work. Uh, all of those are important uh, incentive problems. Class, these are classic things economists think about a lot. Another thing is taking too much or not enough risk. So this was a huge problem at the Wall Street banks, right? There were cases where the employee would get the upside of a risk that they took, like this guy, Jérôme Kerviel, I don't know if you remember that, it's Societe, Societe Generale. You know that he, if he took a crazy bet, um, that if he made a lot of money, he would move up the company. If he lost, well, what's the worst that could happen? He'd get fired, right? Um, or in some cases, employees might be so worried about losing their job if something goes wrong and not getting a lot of upside if something goes well, or they just might be more risk averse. So the company actually wants them to take lots of risks, but they're too afraid of losing their job. Another issue is short-termism. They might not uh, live very long, right? Or they might not stay at the company very long, and so they might not have an incentive to make investments in things that would really pay off in the long term for the company, only stuff that they will end up getting credit for while they're still there. Would it be in general for politicians, uh, um, managers at like public companies? Just, yeah, do sure. Do they never get the benefit, they just want to stay there? And yeah, it's for true for politicians, but for public companies, I mean, all sorts of settings. You know, the truth is public companies aren't that different than, than politicians. They're monitored in a very dispersed way by a large number of people. So many of the same issues that come up in politics come up in publicly traded companies. Um, there's been a number of issues, so those are some of the most traditional incentive problems in economics, but there's been a number of issues that have come up recently that are maybe more interesting or at least more sexy. Um, so uh, empire building is a major concern. <coughs> Many managers are looking out for their long-term reputation, for how people think of them, how famous they are, uh, you know, how many women are interested in them, whatever, right? Uh, and, or men, uh, uh, in the case of female managers, uh, or homosexual, uh, let's not get into all the political correctness. Uh, so, um, uh, potential partners are interested in them. Um, so, uh, the, they might expand, try to expand their business in inefficient uh, ways uh, as a result. Uh, not because they're trying to make profits for the company, but just because they want to be famous and get a lot of credit, right? So it might be much better for you to be the manager of a large company that's not making very much money than of an unknown company that's making a lot of money, right? Uh, for your ability to run for president, for your ability to attract uh, uh, partners, etc., cetera, right? Um, and in fact, there's a lot of evidence that many mergers are wasteful and are really attempts by managers to self-aggrandize. Um, uh, and uh, the interesting thing is a lot of the soft incentives that might help counter you know, some of the incentive problems we were, uh, that other incentive problems might be really harmful here. If you create a corporate culture, if you create uh, you know, an I idea of the vision of the company, like you know, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs might have an incentive to go around putting Apple on everything he could possibly get his hands on rather than money, because he just wants Apple to be well known, right? And that might not be in the interest of the investors in Apple. Um, multitasking uh, is another uh, issue like this. So multitasking is when there are some uh, things that you want the company to do that are easy to measure and other things that are really hard to measure. For example, Imagine that the company is, uh, you know, wants to manage its risk, but also make a lot of money in the short term. Uh, there might be an incentive to try to make it make a lot of money in the short term so the manager gets compensated for that, but then it could blow up in the long term. Sales made versus customer service is another classic example. Another great example that I love is that the Colombian military decided to pay soldiers based on how many people they killed. Now, it was really easy to kill people and not that hard to pretend that those people were militants, right? 
And so they would kill a lot of innocent people and then dress them up in the uniforms of the FARC, uh, the Revolutionary uh, uh, Armed Colombian Group, right? Um, so the question is, what incentives would balance well against multitasking? Well, a natural thing would be things like professionalism, uh, you know, uh, audits, things like that might do a good job dealing with multitasking, right? Another issue is overstaying your welcome. So this is when someone at the company will uh, deliberately do something to make themselves indispensable uh, or entrench themselves so as to make it impossible to fire them. So like someone might invest in a project where they're the only ones who know anything about it. And so if you fire them, the company falls apart. Um, and for that, some incentives that might otherwise sound crazy, like a golden parachute, that when you get fired, you get a bunch of money paid to you by the company, might actually be very useful, because then people aren't too much trying to stay entrenched within the company. Okay, so um, when companies are financed, many of these issues arise. And one of the old problem sets asks you about this, all the old problem sets are now available on the chalk site. Um, but let's try to think about some of the advantages and disadvantages of different ways of financing. So how about uh, personal capital? Is Stephen Denning here? Stephen? No? Well, so the main advantage of personal uh, capital is that you don't have the conflict between the manager, the principal, and the agents. But the disadvantage of it, of course, is that you only have access to a very small amount of capital and you're facing a lot of risk. Um, how about uh, financing by friends and family? Well, this is very common at early stages of a startup, uh, but, um, uh, but is Emily Wilt here? No? Um, uh, but obviously it faces some similar issues. It has the benefits of allowing closer monitoring, allowing people to more easily uh, creating loyalty to the family from within uh, the company. But on the other hand, uh, it doesn't allow you access to that much funding. Venture capital or angel investing is the next step along this uh, road. These are people who usually know a lot about the area who are um, can establish a personal monitoring relationship with the CEO. Um, uh, and they often come in and replace the manager when they come in. Uh, and the advantage of venture capital uh, is that they have these tight connections, but the disadvantage is that they usually don't have access to as much funding <coughs> as the broader market would. Um, Suwan, uh, what do you think are some of the advantages of debt uh, um, as opposed to uh, other forms of financing, such as equity for a company? Um, you have any thoughts? I mean, like, what is. Uh, uh, so, debt is when uh, someone makes a loan to you, and equity is when they own a stake in your company. You're obliged to pay debt back. Why might that be a good way? Why might that give good incentives to someone in a company? Um, I think it would affect your reputation. Yeah, or you might be really worried about not paying it back, and so that might like keep you working hard. Why might equity be better? Uh, well, yeah, and one thing that's nice about equity is that um, like you're getting a share of what's going on. So you're not get, like in debt. If you're already not going to be able to pay back, you might take a huge amount of risk with the person's money because you like either want to get out of debt, right? You want to gamble to get out of debt, or you know you're already screwed. You're not going to pay it back, right? Whereas um, with equity, you're you're in control of all the downside and the upside. Um, so you trade those things off well, right? Um, another uh, issue 
is that um, you can get debt either from a bank or by putting bonds out on the market. Now one thing about a bank is it makes it much easier that if you start to go bankrupt, you can renegotiate with the bank and make sure that you don't inefficiently end up going bankrupt. Whereas when you have a bunch of different people holding bonds, it can be really hard to get them all together to reorganize the company. And uh, is Jackson here? No. What, you know, a good thing about that is you avoid inefficient defaults by the company, but a bad thing is the company's not as scared of a default and therefore they might not work as hard to make sure it doesn't occur. Um, another issue is public uh, equity. Um, you know, that's another very common way that companies, they go for an IPO, they make it public. Um, Grace, is Grace here? Grace Duan? No. So, you know, the advantages of that is you have access to a large pool of capital, but the problem is it's really hard to monitor and there's all these potentials for conflicts among different shareholders. Okay, so that is what we're going to say about the internal organization of the firm. Now I'm going to turn, uh, turn to talking about um, production and costs and supply curves. Now, in general, if I were doing a comprehensive treatment, I would build up the supply curve from production and costs and so forth. But I think you guys all are pretty used to this stuff. So I'm going to skip over this and instead I'm going to talk about what a supply curve is and how that relates to the duration for, with which a firm produces. Um, so um, uh, Jari, is Jari here? Jari uh, Louis? No? Does anyone else want to talk about what the definition of a supply curve is? Yeah. It's Go ahead. Aggregation. Die. <laughs> right? Yeah. Good. It's the aggregation of all the, the sellers in the market. This is just for one firm. For one firm. Yeah. Is there a willingness to sell how much of a, um, do they want to sell at a certain price? Yeah. So that is true, but the thing that it's important to think about is that firms, like, sell over time. It's not like all happening at one instant, right? So a natural question is what, how do we really interpret the supply curve? Um, that depends on the period over which we're thinking of the supply taking face, place, right? So really we're going to think of um, supply as being the average amount that a firm is going to sell if the average price is equal to something. Because of course the price is never exact, almost never exactly constant at something over any significant period of time and a firm doesn't sell things instantaneously. So the way we're going to interpret a static model like you were just describing is in terms of the average amount that a firm will want to sell if on average the price is equal to something over some period of time. Um, and we're going to hold fixed anything that's not under the control of the firm, right? Um, so, for example, when the price changes, we're going to say all that's happened is that the price has gone up and everything else is ceteris paribus if it's not controlled by the firm. That's what we mean by the supply curve. How much, on, if the price is on average equal to P over some period of time, is the firm going to produce? on average over that period of time, holding everything but that price, that average price fix. Including the way in which the price varies. So like when you think of the price going up, imagine the price is sort of like in a cycle. It's like going up and down and up and down. If we say the price went up, what you really meant is that sort of the, all the prices on average shifted up a little bit, but the general pattern of them going up and down stayed the same. So if you think about it, what you've been studying before as a supply curve is really a very interesting object, right? Because everything is happening over time and the prices could be varying. And when you say the pr price goes up, what you really mean is that on average the price goes up even though the temporal pattern of the prices stays the same. So for example, if we say the price of vacations went up, you know, we know that vacations are cheap in some times of the year and expensive in others. So what you really meant is that the price on all times of the year went up, but it stayed the same, the fact that it was cheaper, say, during uh, uh, the term than it was during spring break, right? Okay. 
So these curves denote reactions uh, to price, which is really reactions to shifts in demand. And each curve corresponds uh, in a different time run. So when we say the short run supply or the long run supply, to what would happen if the price changed on average over a short period, how much would supply on average over that period change? Versus a long run supply curve is saying if on average over a long period the price went up, how much would on average over that long period the uh, amount that the firm supplied change? And that's what's really meant by runs. In fact, this is like a very direct, simple notion of what a run is. It means if the production run is this long, then what is the nature of the supply response? That's what long run and short run means originally in Marshall. Um, and in particular, the original notion of a long run was that in a long run, you'd be able to adjust many things. And in a short run, many of those things would be fixed and you would be unable to adjust them, right? So runs are usually then identified, not exactly with time, but with how many different factors can be adjusted over that time period. And there's no universal way to make this identification, but often um, variable factors like unskilled labor or raw materials can be adjusted very quickly. In the medium term, something like the size of the plant could be adjusted, or the method of production. Um, but in the long term, you know, new firms could come into the industry. Or more of the input that you need in order to produce what the firm uses as its input could be created. So like for example, in the um, short term, actually we'll go through lots of examples in a moment. So um, now all of these identifications of certain things with the short and some with the medium, some with the long term are heuristic. Because like for example, as almost as soon as Groupon entered the market, there were a thousand other companies like Groupon in there. So that was very short-term response, and yet lots of companies entered, right? The medical industry um, takes forever to adopt computers, right? Like, it, computers have been around for 30 years, and you would have thought that it, that would have been a very short-run adjustment, right? Especially when there's such a rise in the demand for medicine and yet it's taken almost forever, whereas other industries adopt computers almost immediately. <coughs> so depending on the type of industry you are, you might be able to change the type of technology you use quickly or it might take a long time. So institutional and legal contexts are really important. And so really I think what we should think about is not just the short and the long term and the abstract, but how many years we're actually thinking about and how that relates to the relevant context. But the typical curves you see are these, so the short run marginal cost is less elastic than the long run marginal cost because you can adjust more things in the long run than you can in the short run. Um, and uh, by what's called Le Chatelier's principle, the more things you can adjust, the more you'll react. So for example, imagine that the price of oil goes up. In the short run, you might only be able to um, change how many trips you take each month, which might be hard because you have a certain work. But in the longer run, you might be able to move closer to your work and shorten the length of all those trips, right? So if the price of oil is going to be high forever, you might change your job. But if it's only going to be high for a short period of time, right, you'll only change maybe whether you take vacation that month or not, right? And so some things are more elastic. Uh, so. so uh, to the extent that you can adjust more things in the long run, your uh, responses will be more elastic in the long run than in the short run. So um, one way of representing that in terms of average cost curves is that there might be different technologies you can use depending on the scale of production that you are going to choose. So in the short run you might have a production technology that was optimized to this scale and you might have, you know, very sharp things around that. But in the long run, you might be able to adjust your technology and therefore you'll get these different uh, uh, sh short run average cost curves tracing out a long run average cost curve. And the way they trace it out is that the point that they are best 
adapted to will be the one where they're tangent to the long run average cost because that's the point at which they're the technology that's being used. Now, this is what it will look like. It'll look like something smooth like this if you can change your technologies at each different scale. But if you can only have lumpy technologies, it will look more uh, bumpy like this, right? You'll go up this one and then over to this one, et cetera, et cetera. And this is called the envelope theorem because what it says is that the optimal short run technology will coincide with what you do in the long run at the point to which it was adapted. And that it will trace out an envelope of this curve. This is a more general principle in economics, mathematically, that um, the uh, amount of additional costs for additional production, or the amount by which something changes, if you're choosing things optimally, uh, will be uh, the same as if you hold fixed of the thing that you could choose optimally. If you're at the optimal choice, you can always hold fixed the optimal, uh, that optimization variable. Okay. So a natural question is why you can't, uh, why you can change more goods in the more inputs in the long run than in the short run. Is Suna Mika here? Oh yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I forgot your name. Um, so uh, Suna Mika, why is that how you go? Or do you have a shorter name that you usually go by? Mika. Okay. Uh, so why um, is it that you can adjust more things in the long run than in the short run in this usual story? But, but why, why, why do you think you can change your place of living in the short run, but not in the long run? Oh, I meant that you can't change it in the short run. Sorry, why can't you change it in the long run, but not in the short run? Um, because it's harder to find something in the short run. Yeah, does, does anyone want to build on that? Uh, remind me of your name. Peter? Peter. Because it's a lot of hassle to look for a new home. You have to hire a realtor, find a way to put your old home on the market, explore mm -hmm. open houses. Uh, and if you try to do that in the short run, you're going to get really tired of it really quickly. And I think there's also just a general sense that a lot of people like to have roots. They like to stay in one place for at least a certain amount of time. They don't like yeah. to have to always be in transition. That's right. So some choices are durable. I think is, is, is a sort of a more general way of what you're saying. That is, it's costly to change them quickly. Right. Anything which is costly to change quickly is going to induce a greater elasticity in the long run than in the short run, right? Um, and that's true for some factors, but not for all, right? It really depends on whether things are intertemporal complements or intertemporal substitutes. And in fact, things may be intertemporal complements versus substitutes over different time durations. Uh, sometimes intertemporal complements, sometimes intertemporal substitutes. Can anyone define for me what an intertemporal complement or a durable is? Uh, Claire. Uh, a durable is something that you can use many times within a short time period, kind of like a car. Um, so like the amount of time that you can have the car is limited, like 10 years yeah. of use, and there's like depreciation of the um, over time, yeah. but within that time period, it is um, very abundant. Yeah, that's right. So it's something that lasts for a fixed, non-trivial period of time, like the amount of time you spend in a house, right? Um, and that maybe wears off over time. So like you might want to live in a place for a while, you might not want to live there forever, right? Um, or it might be easier to change, to change the place that you're living after a while of living there, right? So it's something that doesn't make sense to change frequently because it's cheap to enjoy during the time that you have it, but it's expen uh, but uh, you know after some time it might be uh, easier to change, right? Uh, where you live is a classic example. Another um, example, uh, sorry, the opposite of that is an intertemporal substitute, or is what we call it storable or exhaustible. Um, does anyone want to? 
Adam's son is still not here, right? Does anyone want to describe what a storable is? Yeah, Kevin. Um, I guess if its name suggests it's something that can be stored quite easily, but mm -hmm. it has a limited number of times that you can use it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's something that lasts a large, maybe finite, uh, uh, but um, uh, time, but where there's only a certain number of times you can use the thing. And therefore, what causes it to go away, to depreciate, is not time, but the number of uses you make of it. Um, and this makes things cheap to change in the short run, but not in the long run, actually. Uh, why is that? Well, if you, you know, are going to use, say, imagine you have um, some uh, candy that's no longer on the market anymore, right? And you're going to, you have enough so that you can have one bar of this candy each year for the rest of your life. In the short term, you could change that. You could like have five candy bars this year. But you can't change it at all in the long run, right? The average amount you're going to have over the rest of your life can't change at all. Um, I, I think a classic example of this is a vacation, right? It's very easy to say, oh, I'm going to go on vacation this week rather than next week or the week after, right? But going on vacation like on average over the year a lot more would cause you to lose your job, right? Um, so uh, all of this depends on context, but typically um, entry by firms into countries or industries is viewed as something that's very durable. Your education is very durable. It's something you get once in your life and lasts your whole life. Culture political institutions, economic and social institutions, religion, these are things that are thought to be very slow changing to last a very long time. In fact, many people say that all, the only difference between an institution and a policy is how durable it is. Um, somewhat durable things are like machine, job experience, physical plants, production procedures, uh, personal relationships are somewhat durable but they don't maybe necessarily last as long as your education does. Your memory is maybe less durable than some things that are really routine that aren't me like explicit memories you have, but the things you've just come to be used to doing. Virtues are thought to be very durable. Another, another example. Um, something which is variable, that is neither durable nor storable, is like unskilled labor, bulky raw materials, Advertising that just reminds a consumer that they want to have something because it wears off very quickly and you have to continue doing it. Uh, things that you can rent easily so that you don't need to buy them are usually thought to be uh, uh, variable, right? You don't need to commit to having them for a long period of time, but they also don't wear out uh, if you use them because you can always rent it again. Somewhat storable things are inventories of goods for a company. If they use up the inventory today, they won't have it tomorrow. Favors are somewhat storable. You, you can't like just leave them forever, but someone will forget. But if someone owes you a favor, you can't use it up a bunch of times, right? You have, there's sort of trade-offs. Um, discontinued consumer goods are somewhat storable. Usually they won't last forever and usually there's some way to get more of them, but they're, uh, they're valuable in um, the, the, but there is a trade-off across time in using them. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Seinfeld episode about uh, uh, the um, discontinued products that uh, Elaine <laughs> uses, but uh, that's, a, that's a good example of that. Um, so, uh, a very storable example um, is uh, exhaustible resources for a whole economy. So uh, oil, uh, gas, copper, these are things that there's a certain amount of them out there and once we use them up, they're basically gone, right? Um, money for an individual is a very storable resource, right? Uh, a great bottle of wine is maybe even more than extremely storable because it could actually get better over time if you keep it, right? Okay. So why does this all matter? Um, uh, Moon, Moonsu? Where's Moonsu? Yeah. 
uh, why, why does it all matter what things are easier to adjust in the short run than in the long run? Coming back to our earlier discussion. Could you say that? Why does it matter whether things are easier to adjust in the short term than in the long term? Or vice versa? But, um, in the note that we had to read, like, yep. I found that the note gave us a distinction between durable and storable. Yep. Because as we previously just learned that, that um, all, the good, all the goods are better to be adjusted in the long run. Uh, yeah. Some of the factors, maybe the short ones, are still yet quite adjustable, and we need to take that into account. And if that's true, then what will will things be more elastic in the short run or the long run with the storable, for yeah, example? Storables would be more elastic with the short. Run. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's the reason why we care about this. So the Le Chatelier principle says that if you can adjust more things, then your reaction will be greater and that supply is more elastic to shifts that occur over a run when things can be most easily adjusted. And this is independent of whether the thing that we can adjust is a complement or a substitute. So for example, imagine for the relevant good. So imagine that the price of gasoline rises, right? Um, and you'll have a greater reaction if you can change either the amount of travel that you do by, say, moving to a different place, right? which is a complement for gasoline, right? Traveling a lot is, is complementary with gasoline. On the other hand, buying a cleaner car is another thing you might be able to adjust in the long run uh, or when, you know, be able to adjust at some point. And if you can adjust that, that's a substitute for gasoline, right? And being able to adjust that will also allow you to have a greater reaction. So whether the goods you can adjust are substitutes or complements, the more of them that you can adjust, the more you'll be able to react to some change. And this is called the Chatelier's principle. It comes from chemistry. It's the idea that things in a system, when they're able to adjust, allow the system to move more than if they can't adjust, right? And this is the driving force behind the analysis of duration. Supply is more elastic over time frames when more things are able to adjust. And so the key question is how much adjustment is possible over different durations relative to your market opportunities to adjust. So for example, if a durable good, like a car, can easily be rented, it's no longer durable. Because you don't act, it's not actually an investment to buy it. You can just rent it every day. Like zip cars have made cars much less of a durable purchase, right? Because it's made it much easier to rent things quickly. If storables can easily be unloaded or purchased back on a market, they're no longer storable. Uh, if, if a Lane's product were freely available in the market, in fact, that was the whole point, it got discontinued, right? Uh, if it were freely available, she wouldn't have to worry about the trade-offs across time with respect to it, right? Uh, similarly with like a candy that's now uh, off the market, right? So in this sense, uh, I think there are probably more things that are durable because many storables can easily be sold back and forth to the market, but there are still uh, examples where that's definitely not the case. Okay. So let me now focus on the case of durables and talk about things uh, more explicitly over time and how we can use uh, the idea of a uh, durable and a storable to explicitly think about different time horizons. Um, so, for example, um, what is the relationship between durability of a good and the length of the relevant run? Uh, what are short-term reactions to long-term shifts? What are the long-term effects of having many short-term shifts when things are durable? Uh, what happens if it's not clear how long a shift is going to endure? What does the actual time path of price adjustment look like? So these are the types of questions that people typically use dynamic models to study and that maybe in macroeconomics you talked about some when you did these dynamic models. Um, and such models explicitly have different time periods and can get very complicated and confusing to solve. And what I'm going to try to show you is just by thinking about things over different runs and thinking about these notions of storables and durables that we were talking about, particularly durables, we're going to be able to say quite a lot about how things evolve in these temporal ways. 
So a really useful thing that comes out of this is a way to use just static understandings to nonetheless think about in intertemporal uh, dynamics. Um, okay. And the key point is that all static models are are averages of dynamic models over time. And that's why we, we can think about things in this way. Okay, so let me talk about some different types of demand shifts that we might face. One type is a one-time permanent demand shift. Like the iPad is introduced and suddenly forever the demand for paper goes down, right? There's one-time temporary shifts, like the trend for cupcakes uh, recently. Uh, in big cities that I think is already sort of fading. So this is a little bit of a dated example. I don't know what the latest uh, dessert food that's really popular now is, maybe donuts. Uh, cronuts. But donuts. Cronuts, 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 yeah. Come on, donuts are eternal. Yeah, maybe donuts are, but I think there are these you know, spikes. Another thing that can happen is something can go in a secular trend. That means it just goes up for a long time over time. The demand for health care as people have gotten wealthier the demand for healthcare has just gradually risen. So is the demand for education. Another possibility is things can move in a predictable cycle. So an example is seasonal demand for vacations or for electricity, right? Electricity demand is always highest during the summers, second highest during the winters, low during the spring and fall. Uh, vacations are always most popular during times when students are off school. Um, and if there are many durables then cycles just make the overall level of production less efficient. Why is that? Because durable things don't like to be changed frequently. So durable things that have a cyclical demand tend to be very expensive. For example, um, uh, the production, sorry, Electricity tends to be very expensive because of this, because you have to have these giant power plants that have to make all the money to pay for the power plant during the, only, the times of the year when people use them. So they have to have this excess capacity. Similarly, uh, hotels are very expensive relative to what you think it would cost because they only have occupancy during certain parts of the year and they need to pay for all their fixed costs using that, right? Things that move in unpredictable cycles uh, our demand for men's underwear uh, over the business uh, cycle. Uh, because business cycles are unpredictable, right? And it turns out that men, when they're unemployed, like don't buy any underwear. Uh, um, by the way, this, this thing about like the level of efficiency, there's lots of things you can think about that way. If you put in storables, you can get lots of conclusions about when things will be efficient as well. So things that um, have cyclical demand, but uh, you, know, you only have a few of them available, that will actually be really good for storables. It will be really bad for, so anyways, there's, there's lots of cool things you can get out of that. Another thing is that uh, things that just move erratically, that are not even in an unpredictable cycle, they just sort of move around crazily all the time, like the demand for fa various types of fashion items, uh, gold, uh, diamonds, etc. Okay, so we previously exogenously just stuck things into the bucket of being adjustable or not adjustable, but now I want to think about what time durations things will be adjustable over. Uh, and that will affect whether um, they're durables or not uh, when we change from one time period to another. If something is only adjustable over a 10 year time horizon, for example, then it won't be a durable over the one to five year horizon, right? It, it will just be fixed in both horizons and there will be no change in how elastic things are. But if we're considering a five versus a 15 year horizon, then it will be a durable over those horizons if you can adjust it every 10 years, right? Um, okay, so let's consider some examples. Imagine that we're thinking of a five year run um, and imagine the factor is an iPad would you, th like buying an iPad for yourself, like your business needs an iPad, and you're thinking of a five year run of production with the business, do you think that that would be durable over that time horizon or not? Uh, Winnie? Uh, Why? 
Yeah, that's a good that's a good uh, that's a good example. Like by the time five years are gone, people probably won't even be buying iPads anyway, and they only last a couple years anyway, right? So it's very easy to adjust them over that time horizon, right? How about if the run is a two-year run, and we're talking about building a new corporate campus? Uh, Diana Park, is Diana Park here? No. Um, does anyone else want to say w w what they think about that? Miles, right? Yeah, it you know so like you think about Google, right? Google was around for like six years before they built a corporate campus, but it's a huge investment. You really got to think you're going to last for a long time before it makes sense to make that investment, right? So it's extremely fixed. How about a one-year time run, and the investment is hiring new analysts in an investment bank? Uh, is Jennifer Ja here? Anyone want to address that? Uh, remind me of your name. Luke. Luke. Uh, I'd say that's somewhere in between because turnover rate for banking analysts is pretty high. Like two years is maybe a good guess. Yeah. So it's yeah. somewhere in between. Yeah. So it's it's probably relatively variable, but on the other hand, if you don't get a good crop of bankers this year, it might take you a while to build back up, right? Um, uh, how about if there's a 15 year run, so we're thinking about like, you know, the military planning over 15 years, and we're thinking about soldiers to fight in foreign wars. Uh, is Felipe, Felipe's not here, right? We asked before. Uh, Ari, yeah. Isn't that kind of variable? Because I feel like not a whole lot of soldiers make 15 years, right? Well, so uh, I think this is actually m more than variable, it's actually storable. So I think you're going in the right direction. But the reason it might be storable is if you fight like a giant war now, as we found out, like, you know, you get fatigue and people don't want to be soldiers, right? Yeah. Uh, so like Iraq made it very hard for us to fight. Uh, Afghanistan made it hard for us to fight in Iraq. Iraq made it really hard for us to fight in, in you know, Syria, sure. right? Um, so in other words, but on the other hand, over a one year time horizon, it's very durable. Because if you think about the beginning of like World War II, uh, we needed, it took a while to train people to get into World War II. So you see, you see like as the duration changes, things move from maybe being durable you know, to storable to durable. I mean, it, it can really vary over time. Um, and in fact, the relative utilization of fixed and variable factors um, depends on how long the shock is relative to the run over which it can be adjusted. Um, so let's consider some examples. Imagine that there's a short run versus a long run change in the demand for energy. What things would you expect to adjust in those two types of shocks? Uh, is, Stephen's not here, right? Stephen Denning? No. Uh, does anyone want to try to answer that? Yeah, Vitter. So in the short run, you can dig for oil or fracking, and in the long run, you can develop new forms of energy. Yeah. So in the medium term, maybe you can dig for energy, right? In the really short term, you would do, uh, you would really just, you know, burn the wood that's outside, right? Or you might uh, just um, crank up like the, uh, you know, whatever thing you have stockpiled, right? Uh, seasonal adjustments in agriculture, I think, are another uh, interesting example of this. So um, is Minjay Joe here? Yeah, Minjay, how might, uh, like what sort of things go on in agriculture responding to the fact that during certain seasons there's more demand than in others? Yeah, so in agriculture, because there's this cyclical pattern to like when there's the demand for labor, right, there's a lot of short-term hiring that goes on. Uh, whereas um, in the longer, but the amount of land is obviously very fixed. Whereas if there was a longer-term increase in the demand for agriculture, you would bring more land on the market, right? Because that takes longer to do. Um, how about uh, adjustments to the secular trend in medicine? 
uh, how have there been reactions of some factors and not others in that? Is uh, and Andrea here? Andrea Caprusa? No? Peter? Sorry, yeah. what exactly do you mean by secular trends? Secular means like it's just increasing over time, okay. gradually. Thanks. Yeah, does anyone else want to answer that? Uh, remind me of your name. Dave. 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 Yeah. Um, like, there would be, like, not only more doctors, but maybe, like, more opportunities to train new doctors. Yeah, and, you know, eventually more medical yeah. schools. Maybe even in the very, very long term, they might even change the law in order to try to lower the standards for doctors, right? Um, how about, how would you expect things to change when there's a change in the cyclical demand for gold? Like, you know, suddenly people want more gold and later people don't want more gold or gold becomes popular versus the end of the gold standard. Uh, Karen, Chen? Is Karen here? No? Anybody else? Uh, yeah, Kevin. So I guess something that's like cyclical, uh, I know there's a bunch of gold stockpiles that people like hold on to so like yeah. Like the short term yeah. versus the end of the gold standard. Um, I'm guessing that would like reduce demand, so like things like uh, the mining facilities might uh, yeah. facility change. Yeah, so like a typical thing that happens when there's a cyclical upsurge in demand for gold is women start selling their like their jewelry. Uh, whereas in the long term, like tons of mines shut down when the gold standard ended. Um, how about how local governments versus corporations responded to the financial crisis? Uh, Tyler Thomas Moore, is, is he here? Yeah, yeah, Tyler. Yeah. Um, how might they have perceived differences in the duration with which they thought they were going to be hit? Uh, I guess uh, corporations would be more short term, so they would, uh, I don't know, uh, we'll liquidated assets or things like that, and governments um, being long term institutions. Yeah, you sort of would have hoped that that's the case, but actually there was many more layoffs in local government because they were afraid that what happened is that um, the Tea Party was getting into power because of the crisis and the bailouts, and that would cause local government to be decimated for long times to come. And as a result, they laid off a lot of people permanently, whereas a lot of companies held back a lot more because they thought this was just a cyclical thing. Right. Wait, can you explain that again? The why the local government were afraid of the Tea Party doing what? Well, they were afraid that the Tea Party would become popular because of the bailouts, and that they would stay popular for a long time, and that that would like depress the ability of the government to earn revenue, and therefore that they should just lay off people. Because people and, were giving to the Tea Party as opposed to the government. Well, because now that the Tea Party was popular, they would vote in people who would like destroy the state governments, basically. <laughs> you see what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um. Let me see. I'm not going to get through all of this. Uh, I'll take like two more minutes of your time and then we'll, um, we'll go. Um, okay, so it's not only expected duration, but also the time since a shock that matters. So for example, there can be lags in returning to an equilibrium before a shock. So like something could happen, right? Um, and then you could go back to the old like equilibrium level, right? And it could take a long time to return to the way that things were during that equilibrium because you made an investment to deal with the shock and then there was a like gradual process of unwinding that investment. So my favorite example of that is that drug demand uh, dramatically increased uh, to go through Mexico because of what happened in Colombia. Uh, because basically in Colombia they started stopping the flights from Colombia that brought drugs coming to the US and that created more demand for drugs going through Mexico. As a result, there were a huge number of drug gangs that were created in Mexico uh, and then the government eventually was going to crack down on those gangs. But the problem is even though the government cracks down and that may reduce the profitability <coughs> of drug trafficking, all those people who learned how to be drug traffickers and to be violent and so forth it takes a long time to like readjust them to normal life and so they turn into kidnappers instead. So that's like a long lasting effect of the short term increase in the profitability of the drug trade in Mexico. 
Uh, that also happens after a lot of civil wars. So like during civil wars, they'll train people to be violent, and then there'll be violence in the countries for years afterwards, because the people who are decommissioned are only good at being violent and didn't get an education, right? Um, okay, another example is there can be lags in getting to a equilibrium after uh, some change in the environment. So for example, the greatest relative demand for Google relative to other companies was actually six years ago, not today. But Google's actually become largest today because they're still trying to hire people to catch up with all the demand that was created. Um, there can also be lags in adjusting away from or to the fact that the industry is cyclical. So for example, um, there used to be all this migration in cyclically into California to pick uh, uh, farm uh, stuff, but now because there was cyclical demand uh, for the uh, ability to produce, but now there's all these uh, imports from around the world that make that much less necessary. Uh, and um, it's been a very gradual process of unwinding the immigration process for coming into California temporarily. Uh, and immigration laws have gradually changed. So like, there can be all these sorts of lags in changing how things are organized even across time. Um, I think one of the cutest examples of this is what's called cattle cycles. So this is what the number of cattle that are alive in any year looks like. And you see there's this really regular cycle to it. Why? Well, imagine there's a big increase today in the demand for cattle, right? In order to supply that demand, if it's going to last for a while, you might actually reduce the number of cattle you bring to market this year. Why? Because then more, you don't have to slaughter as many cattle, they can breed more, and more cattle come to market. And so that creates a cycle where years afterwards you can still see the effect of one year's increase in the demand for cattle. Because you reduce the number today, that creates an increased supply, then you're going to slaughter those cattle that reduce, you see what I mean? So it follows this, this cycle. Uh, I've got to let you guys go. But I'll, I'll pick up the rest of this uh, uh, next lecture. We only have a couple more slides. <laughs>